Hey guys, um, our, I hope you guys are all having a really good morning so far. Our first two speakers today are two lovely ladies who have made a significant impact on our efforts here at Clemson. This past fall, Dr. Tonkin, Sean, and myself had the opportunity to attend WWF Symposium on Conservation Crime in Washington, D.C. While we were there, we also had the opportunity to meet with Cynthia Carson and Tracy Coppola from International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, at this meeting, we formed a partnership with them, and they have provide us, provided us with countless efforts um, in our community outreach programs, as well as further their knowledge into the policy aspect. That's something that we at Clemson have never really ventured into, is the policy aspect of big cats. Um, so we're really excited to hear from Tracy and Cynthia, and we're really glad that they're here with us. So thank you, Tracy and Cynthia, if you guys want to start your talk. Good morning, everyone. Well, I am Cynthia Carson, and I am the communications officer for IFAL. And what that means is that I work to create awareness about the work that we do on behalf of animals in crisis around the world. Um, what that also means is that we form partnerships with organizations like Clemson's Tigers for Tigers, and, um, and we're very pleased and happy to be here today at the National Tiger Summit, the first annual National Tiger Summit. We're very happy to be here. Um, from elephants to whales to polar bears, IFAL doesn't only work on issues with tigers, but we also cover a range of animals um, around the world um, where we carry out our animal welfare work. And we are in more than 40 countries. Well, I'm sorry, we have projects in more than 40 countries around the world. In the countries where we work, we have strongly campaigned to protect tigers and their habitat. We particularly address one of their biggest threats, and that is the illegal wildlife trade. Some of the drivers of our illegal wildlife trade, which actually goes across the board, but also specifically for tigers, is the lack of enforcement. In Russia and South Asia, IFAL works with CITES and Interpol and other intergovernmental inter organizations to control the illegal tiger and tiger parts and products trade. Um, we work to promote effective law enforcement to end tiger smuggling. In India, IFAL partners with Wildlife Trust and we help to equip frontline field officers. In Russia, under the, lack of the enforcement capacity building, we increase tiger poaching penalties from $50 to $20,000. So hopefully that will have an impact and people will think twice before they do that because if they get caught, they definitely will have to pay the fine. Um, another driver is uncontrollable illegal markets. In China, Russia, and India, this is a particular problem, um, with, especially with increasing demand. IFAR has implemented on that end demand reduction campaigns connecting the links between consumption, of course, which is the demand, as well as poaching, which is the supply. In China, where there are more than 6,000 tigers held captive on a few commercial tiger farms, IFAL launched a public awareness campaign in 2009 that's called Love Tigers. It's a website urging the for the rejection of tiger trade from all sources, and it has been very well received in China. One of the last drivers is inadequate regulations and compliance, and we work on that in both the U.S. and in China. In the U.S., IFAL has helped rescue many tigers. We do the policy side, which, which Tracy will talk about, but we also have an animal rescue side. So we've rescued many tigers and other big cats who've been living in horrible conditions in backyards and roadside zoos. Um, and that gives you a, a brief overview of some of my work. Tracy will definitely tell you what we do here more at home. Um, but to keep track of our latest tiger activities, if you're interested, you can follow us on Twitter at, I, at, at IFAL for action, and that is a four, not F-O-R, so that's at IFAL, uh, at IFAL for action. In the meantime, my colleague Tracy will give you an even more instant update on what we're doing here at home. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Can you see me? I am short. <laughs> I am standing very straight, though. Um, okay, let me just get this slideshow started real quick. All right. So this is, yesterday I was really inspired by um, all the talks about wild, uh, tigers in the wild. And I just wanted a brief showing of hands. I'm going to be really jealous. Um, how many of you have seen a tiger in the wild? Okay. 
All right, so I, yeah, of course. <laughs> so that's, that's the ideal situation. Um, and, and yeah, I'm jealous because like many Americans, I have never seen a tiger in the wild. I've only seen a tiger in captivity. Now, there are an estimated 10 to 20,000 uh, big cats, and that includes tigers, of course, um, in captivity in private possession, roadside zoos, et cetera, in the United States. That, of course, is just an estimation. Uh, we really don't know exactly how many there are out there, uh, which is a frightening uh, concept. Uh, and also, there are more tigers in the United States uh, than there are in the wild. And that's, that's beyond a shame. Uh, in fact, I've actually heard that in Texas alone, there are more tigers in captivity than in the wild. Now, at IFI work, like Cynthia mentioned, on the policy side of things, uh, there are two parts of this campaign at IFA. Uh The first one is the animal rescue. So uh, we're on the ground, uh, and I work with this division a lot because they inform a lot of my work. We're on the ground uh, rescuing tigers from substandard facilities or sanctuaries that have gone under, um, and also from people who have owned these animals as pets and relinquished them. Uh, so far, since 2003, we've rescued 152 uh, big cats, and primarily tigers, um, from those situations. And so then, I work on the policy side of things. What are the loopholes in the United States that we need to close? Um, what are some of the huge gaps that compromise welfare and public safety and global conservation? I look at it as, and personally I look at this too, I think IFA does as well, of course. As an individual, uh, we're looking at a tiger as an individual who is right now languishing in some backyard, in some gas station, you know, all have heard of Tony the Tiger probably in Louisiana, uh, and who's right now languishing in captivity in a substandard facility, um, but also we think of her sisters in the wild and what we can do to save them and how they both inform each other, the welfare aspect and the uh, global conservation aspect. Now, I don't know if you guys can read this amazing cartoon um, that I picked up over the internet. I'm being sarcastic, it's not amazing. But it, so anyway, I'll read it to you because you won't laugh. Um, it says, you, Kevin Muldoon, on the afternoon of February 2nd, the year of our Lord, 1977, at 3.47 p.m., were observed entering the arcade alone and unattended and therefore proceeded to indulge in the act of playing pinball until the said action was impeded by the arresting officer. How do you plead? So what, what's up with that? Am I just being random and weird and trying to wake you up in the morning? I am weird, I am random, but I, I'm, not, I'm trying to, you know, this is actually a point here. Do any of you have any idea why I just did this? Okay. So, that's okay. That's, I mean, why would you? So, did you know that in South Carolina, um, it is illegal and you will be penalized for playing pinball if you are under the age of 18? They really will go after you. I'm not making this up. I thought it was some weird urban legend, but it's the truth. It's in statute. It's in the South Carolina Juvenile Justice Code. Um, all right. So then, do you know what South Carolina's law on Possessing, owning a tiger is? There's, not, there's no restrictions. There's no law. You're right. Um, I, I, I find that to be an interesting contrast. There may have been better examples of that, but I just I find that to be remarkable that such a, a strange law exists, yet for something so important and so critical to welfare and public safety, uh, South Carolina, unfortunately, falls short. There are some examples of problems. Uh, in 2002, in Easley, where, do you guys know where that is? Um, there was an eight-year-old boy who was bitten by his dad's pet tiger, and he was severely mauled. In 2003, in Lexington County, uh, there were two pet African lions that got loose. They were running around this community for 45 minutes. Um, and then in Lawrence County, there was a 200-pound pet cougar that escaped. And those are just, a, you know, the tip of the iceberg probably in terms of incidents. We keep a database of, this in, of the incidences, and I'll give you the link to that. 
But I mean, I think Carol for sure is certainly an expert on all these incidents as well. Um, but we say, I mean, this certainly is the tip of the iceberg. This is what the media reports. There's probably a lot more, but you know, even so, clearly South Carolina has a ways to go. And, and, and not just South Carolina, I'm not just going to pick on your, your state or, or your school state. Um, a lot of other states have a ways to go. So, uh, so we go on with this campaign at, for IFA, the U.S. Big Cats crisis and the need for reform. Um, there are three main aspects of this problem that helps me to categorize things, because sometimes I can be scattered. Uh, there is, first, the big one is that there's a widespread problem. Um, there's, <laughs> there are widespread practices in the United States where uh, tigers and other big cats are kept in private possession. And this compromises public safety and animal welfare and global conservation. So that is, that is the core to the campaign. And then secondly, but very importantly for policy reform, the current <clears throat> federal regime, so the federal laws that are in place and the agencies that um, oversee this problem, uh, it can't, the current federal regime can't really address the problem. They're struggling to address this crisis that we have. Uh, and so therein lies a lot of opportunity for us to address reform. And then um, the third thing that I focus on, and this also goes to our, back to our animal rescue um, campaign, is that sanctuaries, uh, although they're critically important and, you know, amazing uh, for m many of them, um, they are not the answer to the problem. So we'll go into that a little bit more uh, later on. So did you all hear, you guys are really savvy, so I mean, hats, uh, you'll, you'll have answered this question probably. Um, do you, did you all hear about the Ohio, Zanesville, Ohio crazy incident, and a lot of people are nodding. So yes, um, all right, well definitely that shed yet another light. I mean, I feel like every few years we're talking about this, we're talking about it all the time, but you know, on a national scale, it seems like we have a crisis like that every you know, a few years. Um, in Ohio was, Ohio, I'm from Ohio, so um, I, growing up I didn't really realize how crazy that state is um, in terms of keeping exotics. Uh, but in Ohio, um, you know, 50 animals, 50 exotics were let loose by this guy who, who had been keeping them as in his menagerie. There were 38 cats in that, uh, in that group and he just let them go um, and then uh, proceeded to kill himself. Um, I think the point there is, of course, that brought it on a national scale once again, and it was a huge tragedy. Um, and police had no choice but um, to kill the majority of those animals. Um, it also forced Ohio to change its law, because before that, Ohio was like South Carolina. It was like the Wild West, nothing, uh, no reform. Or, forgive me, no restriction, but it led to reform. So it got Ohio to change. But really, it's, as I've mentioned a little bit ago, it's not the first time that this has happened. Um, but unlike Zanesville, there are a lot of human tragedies. So officers had to kill those animals before they got spread further into the community and could have caused a lot of human deaths or uh, maulings. There have been about 22 deaths that we know of, uh, including five children, and nearly 200 um, maulings, very dangerous incidences since 1997. There are uh, organizations that go back even further um, that have higher numbers, but IFA has a database of, of these incidences. So that's a, a startling amount that we know of. Um, you know, it, there will be more. Incidences. I mean, since Zanesville, there have been more. Um, just last month, there was the girl who was killed um, by a lion at, in a kind of a pseudo sanctuary in uh, California. So we talk about public safety a lot. Um, just quickly looking at these photos, uh, we have a little girl, and, and I think there's a little boy next to her, who <coughs> this was actually provided by Big Cat Rescue. So thank you, Carol and Howard. Um, this is a little girl and a little boy. There's an adult in there, I guess. Um, they're holding a, 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 a cub, a tiger cub. There's the Detroit Tigers, um, the professional um, baseball team. 
don't know if you guys heard about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, they had a photo opportunity with big cats or um, with uh, cub t tigers. And then there's this little girl and she's leaning against, which is a pretty large um, juvenile um, tiger. So, I mean, Dr. Tompkins asked last night, what is our proper relationship with animals? And I think this really speaks to that. I mean, also, what does it say about public safety and animal welfare and global conservation? It's these cubs actually are bred intensively, or the, their, their parents are bred intensively in order to supply these cubs for exhibition so that exhibitors can travel around and provide these opportunities for people to pose and hold these really charismatic species. I mean, no doubt, they are beautiful. Obviously, we all agree with that, and they're very cute when they're little. Uh, but there is a disconnect, right? I mean, when you see these uh, images, and if you don't really know, you know, the ramifications of this, then you just think, well, why not? I want, I want one too. And, um, you know, there are a lot of comments, especially on this Detroit Tigers, uh, there was a, a, they had it on their Facebook page, and there were a lot of comments of people saying, I want a, a baby, I want one too, I want a baby cub um, as well. So it, it really, not only is very terrible for the animals itself, this is a wild animal, it's incredibly disrespectful, it's incredibly dangerous, but there are also a lot of big unknowns uh, in terms of what happens to these uh, cubs when they grow too uh, big. Um, to be handled to, when it's too dangerous. Um, where do they go? Do they go to roadside zoos? In many cases, are they um, killed? They could, could be, yes. Uh, are they auctioned off? It is just perpetuates the cycle of needing to have these cubs and needing to travel around with them and, um, and then having this huge surplus of older tigers where that compromise public safety. Um, the USDA has an informal policy uh, on this where this is actually very, this is legal. Um, if a cub is under eight weeks old uh, or over 12 weeks old, the USDA says, you know what, exhibitors, you can't actually have people hold them and pet them and touch them. Um, but of course, there are a lot of violations. I would say probably the little girl leaning against the tiger is a violation of that informal policy, but the point is, is that it leaves a four-week window between eight weeks and 12 weeks where it's pretty much a free-for-all. I mean, there are certainly lots of violations. It's USDA is having a really hard time handling this uh, at all. Um, there are a lot of violations. I'll just speak quickly to one that you guys probably know. In 2005, there was a girl, um, who was posing for her senior photo. She was in high school. Her name was Haley Hildebrand. Um, she, was, she was killed by a tiger that she was posing with because it was a large tiger. She was, I think, told, I had heard that she was told she would be posing with a cub. Um, but anyway, she posed with a, a larger tiger just held by a leash by the exhibitor, and then the tiger killed her. Well, that's an example of um, the ramifications uh, with this very large situation. At first, when I learned about it, I thought, well, you know, this cub petting, cub handling industry, this is very discreet. It doesn't seem like, I had never heard of it when I was younger, but it is a large enterprise, and there's a huge incentive um, for breeding and more captivity um, of these animals. So another element of public safety are the people who have to respond to the tragedies. Like, this is a, a sheriff, uh, Sheriff Lutz from Zanesville, Ohio. So he was the sheriff that had to make the call to uh, unfortunately put, uh, kill a, a majority of the animals and actually had to have his officers just thrown into this incredibly dangerous situation that they weren't prepared for. And not just, this is not just an Ohio thing. Across the country, first responders are not trained to respond to exotic animal incidences on, uh, in general. <laughs> Um, they're not equipped. Uh, the taxpayers have to, you know, bear the burden of this as well. Um, and in fact, we've commissioned, um, we've been working with some first responders that are going to come up with some numbers so that we can get a better handle on what, how much Ohio costs us or how much Ohio costs taxpayers. 
Um, and they're really starting to be a voice, the first responders. Um, and it, they're a classic example of collaboration that Sean was kind of alluding to yesterday. You know what, I want to stop right now and I want to show you a video um, that speaks to this more interestingly than, than me. Um, so here, let me go. It's about five, five minutes. I started Outreach for Animals about 12 years ago. I've been doing this for 40 years. And the uh, reason I started Outreach for Animals is because it's always police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and animal control personnel who are not trained always are the first ones called out when a tiger is loose. This particular incident here, you don't really get training on when you go through the police academy. None, none of the uh, deputies in the state of Ohio carry tranquilizer guns in their cruisers. Uh, some agencies might have one or two guns that they have, you know, at their agency to, to use if they have an animal that gets loose. If I have a patrolman that's in a situation has his cat hemmed up, and before we can get that tranquilizer up here, he's not going to let that cat stray. Okay, we just we can't take that chance. It's not that we don't like the animals. Uh, we're not, you know, it, it's it's a it is a public safety concern. Even though these were raised as pets, they still are could be wild animals. But even if you bottle fed this animal all the way up, you never know when it reaches sexual maturity that what that animal is going to do. Um, you no, know, it was 5:15, 5:30 before the first cars were dispatched. It was getting dark by 7.30, and uh, there was just no way of being able to safely do anything with a tranquilizer gun. The situation at that time, it was getting dark, it was raining, uh, no dart rifles. Uh, it was a situation where they couldn't use dart rifles. Uh, they had to do what they had to do. One of our first things that we did was put out a uh, emergency broadcast message to let the public know that we had uh, exotic animals um, on the loose. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure they knew what was going on because the biggest fear there was we, we didn't know how much of a head start uh, these animals had on us or, or when they had been turned loose. Those animals in Zanesville did not need to be killed. You know, even though law enforcement had to do it, okay, but it goes way back. It's not the cops on the scene. It goes back to legislation. It goes back to people that knew better they could have stopped it. Emotionally, for our officers, it affected some of them differently than others. There's, there's a couple of our deputies that, um, you know, it, uh, it took a lot out of them to do what they had to do. Yeah, and w one thing about dealing with these animals, too, is, you know, it's always the cops, the firemen are always called to the houses when there's a tragedy or something going down or something escapes. And people don't realize how much danger that puts these officers into, and because uh, they have to make split decisions on a situation where it could be, uh, you know, you've got a moving animal that you don't know. It's all abstract all the time. Not one call is the same. Everything is different, and and they're scared to death. I have never met an officer that had a shoot at dangerous exotic or was involved with it that doesn't have nightmares afterwards. Uh, if it can happen in little town of Zanesville, Ohio, uh, it can happen in any, any one of those seven states that don't have any kind of legislation. The way to prevent something from occurring is get the proper legislation, get in there and take care of it. You know, IFAL's sponsorship of the Big Cats Public Safety Protection Act, it, it, it's, it's going along the same lines that we're, we're trying to put some guidelines and restrictions in place that people have to follow. and hold them responsible and accountable. I want the laws passed. I've seen what they've done. So I know for a fact, if you pass the laws, things change. Things do change. And, and I think that's what law enforcement's all about, um, you know, making sure that our citizens are responsible and accountable for their actions. I think it's a debate because we are a country of liberties and freedoms. And people think they have a right 
own a tiger. It's not your constitutional right to do this. You can't bring dynamite into an apartment building in downtown. That's public safety, okay? That's common sense. Why do you think you can bring a tiger or a cobra into an apartment building and, you know, think that's okay? And I think anybody that is um, objecting to uh, acts such as the Big Cats Public Safety Protection Act, uh, I think they need to look back at our incident and remember that incident and remember that um, anything can happen. One thing I want to give, I want to put out a warning for people that are thinking buying something that's dangerous. First, I want you to go to your emergency room or go to your family doctor or go to the paramedics that are on the squad and say, if my tiger gets out, what kind of dart rifle do you have? What can you do to humanely capture my animal? And when they don't have an answer for you, except shoot it, I think that should tell you right there there's a problem. So the public safety element clearly is critical to our campaign. Uh, and it's a voice, I think, that um, lawmakers, whether or not they're interested in animal welfare, they're, they definitely perk up when you bring that up. Um, here, I'm just going to get back to my current slide. I'm just going to get a little bit into the animal welfare aspect again. Uh, there are other ways to abuse tigers. I, I've talked about um, the cub petting industry. This is, you know, an atrocious uh, other practice where this one facility, that is actually the same exhibitor that um, provided the Detroit Tigers, that cub. Um, they uh, make money off of people swimming with baby cubs, with tigers. So just uh, let that settle in. It's completely... It's awful, but it's legal right now. Now, even with the best intentions, some people get in over their heads. They just might not be informed. It's not really a, a good excuse. Um, but then there are other people that clearly are just um, abusing these animals. Um, many, many uh, licensees um, have been found to abuse uh, the tigers that they keep. Now, this is a huge, uh, key example. I don't know if you can read it, but. Um, there is a, a facility, a USDA licensee in, uh, in California, um, and he had abandoned over 90 tigers, that, and law enforcement found 58 uh, cubs um, stuffed in freezers on his property. And this, he was left, left these behind, and ironically, his uh, place was called Tiger Rescue. So it, just another example. Um, there, just to give you a flavor of, um, this is, Cub displays at the mall, um, people posing again with their, um, well, this is a pet tiger in, in that, in that right-hand slide. Um, just to give you a flavor of what's going on in South Carolina, aside from the lack of regulation, there are um, six uh, licensed uh, breeders slash exhibitors in South Carolina. Um, and there's one major exhibitor, uh, and he operates out of Myrtle Beach. Uh, and he's notorious for taking cubs to malls and, and breeding tigers. Um, very charismatic personality, unfortunately. Um, uh, tells a lot of people he does it for conservation. So it's, it's another uh, problem that we have where um, the message is very um, skewed. Now to go to global conservation real quick, um, there's no way of knowing. It's a big unknown, again, of um, how many uh, big cats are, are disposed of or how they're disposed of or if if their parts are illegally sold there's been some indications of that and that's why the World Bank's um, Global Tiger Initiative called upon the US to phase out its uh, captive tiger population a few years back I think the US is quick to accuse China of having you know, a lot of demand for tiger parts and certainly that's there but Clearly, we have a lot of work to do in our own country. Real briefly, I'll go over enforcement um, and costs. Well, you may know this, but uh, this is keeping big cats in captivity in the United States is largely governed by two agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they, uh, oper they look, um, uh, forgive me, they, uh, they uh, cover the Captive Wildlife Safety Act so they're the entity that um, is, that's their jurisdiction. 
Um, now, that act right now, it covers some interstate commerce of uh, big cats, uh, transportation of big cats across state lines. Um, that is not legal uh, in many cases, and um, trade is not legal in many cases, but what, a, um, what the Captive Wildlife Safety Act does is it also exempts USDA licensees, it does, and it also doesn't get to the pet, um, in-state pet trade issue at all. Now we've got the APHIS, which is, operates out of USDA, and they cover the Animal Welfare Act. That's their jurisdiction. So they're really looking at the people who have USDA licensees who exhibit the animals. Um, and frankly, I mean, in terms of cost, the resources for enforcement um, are lacking greatly. Um, for example, in 2011, there was an audit of USDA, and they found that there are only about 105 inspectors that oversee at almost 8,000 facilities. And these are facilities that aren't just big cats. They're across the board warm-blooded animals. So puppies, um, you know, all kinds of animals that go beyond big cats. Uh, so they really don't have the capacity to oversee this huge problem. Um, meanwhile, animals suffer and the repercussions are very rare. Uh, it's hard to really um, keep track of uh, the inspections, it's, it's a, a huge problem in the United States. And maybe we could talk a little bit more about that offline as well. Um, certainly the cost is a huge problem uh, uh, for everybody involved, for the people that have these tigers, um, for the local governments. It takes a, roughly up to $10,000 a year to um, feed a tiger and they need huge spaces to roam. Um, which really can't be provided uh, very well in captivity. Uh, and many owners quickly realize they're in over their heads. Um, and then I, you know, I asked that question, are sanctuaries the answer? Um, and certainly there are many amazing sanctuaries like Big Cat Rescue and Carol Baskin is here, and they're certainly um, you know, the gold standard of, of Big Cat's uh, sanctuaries. But really, you know, that, that's kind of a, a, a Band-Aid on the problem. Um, Sanctuaries, even very reputable ones, can't take in all of the um, surplus big cats in the United States. They just can't. Um, a lot of them are nearing capacity and they lack reserves for more than um, a few months of, at a time. So it's, it's a very big problem. Um, IFA has moved big cats from, like I said, all over the, the nation. Uh, these are just some images and, um, where we've uh, worked with reputable sanctuaries to place um, big cats and this is going to become more and more of a problem as the uh, big cat population grows and also as regulations which we're fighting to get implemented but also as regulations get implemented there's going to be a movement of big cats um, whether people feel like they have to relinquish their animals because the government's going to come after them etc or people just are starting to realize they really can't take care of these animals uh, or the government um, hopefully will be a little bit more um, involved in the process of, of oversight. So what is the answer to all of this? There's probably a, you know, a couple of answers, but we uh, feel that right now what we really need is we need to look at this legal patchwork in the United States. Um, we need to have a federal solution that closes all these loopholes where there are six states that don't have any restrictions, and then there's this patchwork of states that kind of have restrictions, but they, you know, they're kind of loosey-goosey on things, and then there are states that have bans. But um, really, I mean, we need to have a bright line rule, a bright line law on this issue. Um, the, we actually have, uh, I have brochures on um, our initiative that we're trying to pass in Congress. It's called the Big Cats and Public Safety Protection Act, and I'd like to have each of you to have one of these uh, if you go to our, um, it'll have a, a link to our, our new site where we keep a database on um, all the laws, on the cub petting trade, and the incidences that we were able to link to articles. There's a bunch of information on there. And again, this is pointing to South Carolina as not having a restriction um, on, the, on this trade. Uh, now, what the Big Cats and Public Safety Protection Act seeks to do is it seeks to phase out the captive tiger or captive big cat uh, population. Now it's a huge ambition, for sure, it's a huge ambition. Um, 
but and there are, there are some exemptions, of course. But um, it really does try to get to um, stopping uh, big cats from keeping people from keeping big cats as pets and exhibitors from breeding them and perpetuating this cycle. So what it does, it, it would be a ban um, on private possession and breeding uh, with certain exemptions. In fact, one of the exemptions includes colleges. Um, uh, and current owners would be grandfathered in. I mean, there's are certain things that we have to do in order to make this palatable um, politically. Uh, but current owners would be grandfathered in to the law as long as they register their animals with USDA. At least USDA will then know or have a handle uh, on where the big cats are. Um, now, uh, there are some things you guys can do. I mean, yesterday um, I went with Sean and some of you guys, Melissa, uh, Taylor, um, to Senator Graham's district office. Senator Graham is, uh, of course, a, North, a South Carolina senator, Lindsey Graham, been around for a while. He's very conservative, um, but he has spoke to some um, animal issues in the past. Uh, I mean, you know, I think getting your voice out and as constituents of a South Carolina um, school is very powerful. Um, and certainly we would want to work with you on doing that, on, on making those visits. You don't just have to you know, con contact Senator Graham's office. There are many more. This bill is going to get introduced in a few weeks. It'll have a, a number in a few weeks. So we can really get going on, you know, honestly, and emails and calls even to district offices or office, congressional offices are huge. I mean, it seems like a passive thing to do, but it's not. They really want to hear from their constituents. And I know a lot of you aren't from South Carolina. You're from all over the place. So, so really, on, uh, if we could work with you on passing this bill, of really getting some momentum on it this year, and using the public safety aspect of this problem to uh, really further our cause, um, I think we could be a powerful voice together. If you guys get, have any questions, I'm going to pass this along. Um, and you have the URL to our, uh, our site for the campaign, but of course you'll have my business card as well and you should contact me because I want to hear from you because you are an incredibly impressive um, voice that uh, is honestly much more powerful than mine. Um, you know the issue, you are direct constituent. So I applaud you, but um, please let me know if you have any questions about anything that I said or left out. Or maybe I've just spoken too much, because you know, probably, right? You take questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good morning. Uh, I just like to know with this bill, which is being introduced, is there any way to uh, increase the public awareness of this bill coming in because I do not know yeah. if there is much publicity about this act because this is very interesting for countries like us to right. know. So can there be a movement, a practical movement I'm talking about mm -hmm. to make it aware through Twitter, through Facebook, yes. through publicity, to articles and maybe send your uh, contemporaries who are working in 40 countries right. a message that this bill is being introduced so that you can gain support from that, those areas as well. Yes. Can that be looked into? I think so. Uh, I mean, we're, we actually have, I mean, Cynthia can probably speak with communication stuff much more than me, but we, uh, yeah, I mean, I think definitely within the United States, we're going to have a really large campaign. We're going to grow it virally. Yes, on the other on the other countries too. Um, I think sometimes Congress looks at this in a very insular way. How is my state? How is my state impacted? Whatnot? We lose that global um, perspective. So you know what? I think I don't have an answer on the other countries, but I think that we should think about that and really move towards. That. Or maybe an information <coughs> could be sent to the other countries where the tiger is found that this kind of a bill is yes. being introduced. Yeah. Thank you. And then I'll make sure that, that we provide Because th th this, is, this is very, very important for us. Okay. Because yeah. in all our government policies, we are talking about the pressure. 
so but we are not aware of this bill. Right. So I'll be really uh, obliged in case you could give us a further details to me personally and we could put it across. Yeah, we Thank could you. definitely get our other international offices yes. involved. <coughs> and important. even though our government is more concerned with what, the, of course, the U.S. citizens have to say in their opinions, but we definitely will take emails. We will present everything, you know, even though the one in the consideration might be the American. So like the Elephant March, where we had everyone chime in. And I have another request to all the speakers that whatever resource material you are having, if we could all get a copy so that we can carry it with us and you know we can put it across it's very very important these figures are not available otherwise we have time just for one more question yeah no i'm here i'm not trying to steer it away from the, the front just want to get you this information what is your timeline for passing the bill or getting it introduced. Okay, so the, oh, thank you. So the bill right now, the bill right now um, just got, uh, it, it just went to legislative drafting, which means that the sponsor, I should also say who we're working with, it's all in the packet, but uh, we're working with uh, Representative Buck McKeon and Loretta Sanchez. They are uh, representatives out of California. Um, and they just sent the bill to legislative drafting, which just means they're just crossing, you know, dotting their I's, crossing their T's, and have their drafters looking at it. That could take a couple of weeks. So I would look, you know, we'll certainly let everyone know, but I would think that the bill would probably have a number and be an official bill in the public eye uh, early May. Um, now, a congressional session is two years, so we have, you know, until the end of 2014. And then it can get reintroduced, of course. But um, of course, we're hoping for momentum and committee passage. There are, you know, there are those hurdles that it needs to go through in each chamber. Um, and of course, we're looking for a Senate bill as well. So there are just a couple of things that we that you need to do before it actually um, officially becomes. Well, not a couple of things. It's a huge undertaking, but uh, you know, just procedurally. So I think you know, for you uh, to just remember early May, and I'll make sure that everyone knows. You can start. You can even start contacting your representatives now, because because um, certainly what they like is when the bill is introduced, there are the, the key sponsors, but they also like to have original co-sponsors, so that just other people that sign onto the bill and say that they're supportive, even ahead of time. So anything is appropriate right now to uh, talk about this bill. And it's going to be in the house. Yes, it's going to be in the house right away. Uh, you know, in May, uh, the Senate just forthcoming. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm working on that. 